One of the benefits of my nomad capitalist journey has been that I was able to legally reduce my tax rate from living in the United States, paying about 43% of my income, to moving overseas and paying, give or take, about 1%. Today, I'm gonna to tell you how I did that. We got asked by Sarah Mitchell, who said, I'm new to your channel. You may have already done this, but if not, where did you move to where your tax rate is 1%? Did you learn the language? And how did you transfer things like your savings accounts and 401k? Also, how does the IRS, the tax agency in the US, verify that you've moved overseas and stopped taxing you? Now, if it's your first time here, my name is Andrew Henderson. I'm the founder of Nomad Capitalist. We're a boutique consultant firm that helps seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally reduce their taxes, diversify and protect their assets, increase their personal freedom, and just increase their lifestyle to be more productive. You can learn more at nomadcapitalist.com. And we also host the biggest and best offshore conference called Nomad Capitalist Live, open to everyone. So this is the question that no one wants to answer. I'm willing to go out. And when we started Nomad Capitalist many years ago, it was at a time when the offshore world was... Uh, a lot more nebulous and people used stock photos and fake names and there was guy, you know, pictures of guys on motorcycles with helmets on like nobody really knew who was working with. I said, listen, someone's got to come out and say, this stuff is legal. Not, not all, but not, not what everyone's doing, but the stuff itself is legal. Someone's going to say, real name, real face, I'm going to talk about it and I will take the slings and arrows. And I have. And certainly there are folks who don't like it. But my perspective of this is we have an increasingly uh, global world. When I was eight, nine, 10 years old, and I had a big world map hanging on, the, on my wall in my bedroom, I would look at all the different countries and I would say, I wonder what it's like to go there. And when I started traveling as an adult, I realized that every country has some kind of benefit. What some countries do, especially smaller countries in many cases, is they say, hey, move to our country. And even if uh, either we'll have a low tax rate or we'll have a zero tax rate, or we'll have some kind of tax incentive for the first five or 10 years, or foreigners get a special deal because, hey, we figure you wouldn't move here if we didn't, so we wanna bring foreigners and their capital in. And so I don't look at this as reducing taxes, especially seeing that my 1% is a lot more than a lot of people's 10, 20, 30%, and what the average person where I come from in the United States, the average person is not paying a lot. In fact, as much as two out of every three people in the United States in 2020 paid zero in federal income tax, and then they complain that people like me don't pay enough. When I lived in the United States, they paid a lot more than they would ever pay in their lifetime. And finally, not just for tax reasons, but because I just didn't really feel like I fit in with the country, I wanted to live in different places, I wanted the lifestyle benefits, I decided to move somewhere else. So you'll see guys like Mark Cuban, Warren Buffett, they'll brag about their taxes and patriotism as some kind of guilt, I think, in some cases. You see now people like Abigail Disney who are always saying, tax me more, even though there's literally a form on the U.S. Treasury website where you can send them a patriotic gift, and yet these people never do it. They just want you to pay more. And so, uh, you you know, if, if a place lowered your prices, if a business lowered your price for a good or a service, you wouldn't complain. You would take the lower price. And so for someone like me who was looking to live overseas anyway, the drastic reduction in taxes on my business was a welcome benefit. Um, and so taxes are a cost, companies manage them, so can you both for yourself and uh, for your business if you have one. So what did I do? Where specifically did I go? The short answer is I didn't go to any one particular place. I followed our strategy, um, the decades old strategy of planting flags around the world. And as I tell you this, by the way, this is not tax advice for you. I'm just kind of telling you what I did. Obviously there are things that I will say that certainly depending on where you are in the world could be misinterpreted. Obviously I encourage everyone to, as the goody two shoes of the offshore world, follow all your local rules, regulations, do everything above board. And if you don't like those rules and regulations then find a place where you can go and you can get out of the system. You can go where the, the rules and regulations and tax rates match what you think is fair. So I incorporated uh, overseas, we have a number of different structures in our company now. Our company does pay more tax now than when it first started out because we have um, about 60 people working for us around the world. Um, we do have a couple people who are employed on freelance agreements, which are, are perfectly legal. and We just kind of pay their taxes for them and then they just pay them themselves um, in countries where that is welcomed. In most countries uh, where we operate, we are paying payroll tax and stuff like that. Uh, and we are paying some level of, of corporate tax based on the value added in that country. So um, the idea that our co company pays zero is not the case anymore. When it was just me or me and a few people, you're just starting out, it's pretty easy just to incorporate somewhere. 
Uh, initially, we were set up in Hong Kong. Now we have you know, structures all over the world. And so you can incorporate somewhere where it's zero tax, and that solves the business part. Now, people often misunderstand, like incorporate in the British Virgin Islands or the UAE or whatever else. You can't do that and then just like sit in your country. Now, there are maybe some more advanced strategies in some cases where that, you know, there could be some benefit. But generally speaking, if you're just a person running a business and you're, you know, your mind and management or your central control or whatever it's called in each country is there, that's a problem. OK, and so you have to do is follow my tax friendly quadrant where you have you and on the other side, you have the business, and then you've got where you're leaving, and then you've got where you're arriving. You've got to satisfy all four parts of that. So your business can leave Canada, the US, Germany, whatever. Depending on where you are, there may be some kind of you know, fee to move that stuff out. A lot of times there's not, but there may be, depending on how big the business is, right? And then where is it arriving? Hopefully in some place where it is, it is zero tax. And so the strategy now in our case would be um, we choose places to hire that we think there's good talent, um, where it's affordable, where you know it's it's flexible enough just for numerous benefits. Uh, but then we're not going to base the entire company in, let's say, a, a Serbia, for example. Nothing wrong with Serbia, but in terms of like world-leading efficiency for kind of international payments and operations and all that, it's just it's not there. But you know, you you pay something to Serbia for the privilege of right, we have a presence in Serbia. So that's the, the incorporation part, and so. Is the 1% tax apply to me? It probably still does because obviously the business is, is much, much, much bigger than when I first moved. And so you're paying something uh, and it still stays relatively low. So where did I personally move? I personally moved essentially nowhere. The first uh, number of years, I was nomadic. I started off doing basically a month. I would go to Asia, I would go to Eastern Europe, and I would just kind of say, I'm going to spend a month in each place. I'm going to make a list of who I would like to meet, whether it's individual entrepreneurs, whether it's groups of people I want to infiltrate, um, whether it's a you know, bank CEO. And I got kind of different appointments, and I just kind of felt the vibe of these places, moved around, looked for business opportunities, kind of got the whole perspective. Um, that at some point then just became kind of very nomadic, where I was bouncing around a lot, and over time started developing bases to where now I spend time between uh, different home bases. I really spend very little time these days in hotels. I've come to loathe even the finest of hotels. Uh, if you do it for well over a thousand nights, you'll probably feel the same way. I like to have properties, which I've used some of the savings to cash flow, where I now get to invest in other people's countries, um, oftentimes get residence or citizenship or some other benefit by having that property, and I get to spend time there. Um, but I really don't spend time living in like, here's where I live. Um, where I lived in 2020, I was in Malaysia for a good amount of time because the world was closed down, and Malaysia fortunately, was, it is a very tax-friendly place. In 2021, when Asia was more closed down, I spent a decent amount of time living in Latin America, both for our conference, uh, where I was in Mexico for about two months, and in Colombia in, in, in a home, because that was the place that was open. And then I would be in Eastern Europe. So it kind of depends based on year. And so the fact that the world is, is in such chaos right now is why it kind of continually changes. Now I'm back, uh, to a certain extent, in Malaysia and just kind of traveling around. So the United States allows you to just basically, as long as you're not there. And I, I didn't want to be in the US, right? So my perspective was, I didn't, it wasn't like, how much time can I spend in the, in the US and not pay taxes? Like, taxes or no, I want to be here, zero. Uh, for years, I didn't even fly through. I just, it's like, oh, I'm going from Mexico to Europe? All right, how do, how do I not go through the US? I just didn't want to be there. Uh, I'm not saying that you should be that way, but that was just my personal perspective. So my thing was, if I'm going to spend zero time, I was able to qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion in the United States because Americans are always taxed no matter where they live, but you can dramatically reduce or even eliminate in some cases that tax. Um, and so basically, I didn't have to live in any one particular place. Now, if you are from somewhere else, you probably want to build a tax residence. It's not my advice to you, but generally speaking, if you came to me as a client and you worked with our various you know, team members, they'd say, okay, where are you going to pay tax? Where are you going to spend some time? And how does that correlate with what you're doing in your home country? Okay, again, the less time you want to spend in your home country, the better. But the U.S., even though it's not a perfect system, at least allowed me to say, I don't know where I want to go. I'm just going to bounce around. It's a little bit harder for most people, um, especially if you want to go back and spend summers in Canada. Um, I do know have a tax residence in a tax-friendly place. And by the way, I'm no different than any of the locals. Um, they also get to exempt all the um, tax all their foreign income from tax. So basically, it's a country where if you earn money from a salary, if you run a local business, you run a bakery, you run a car dealership, you pay tax. But if you earn money from somewhere else, this country, and there's a number of them that do this, 
don't believe like, hey, that's not generated from our activities, so we don't want to tax you on that. So I'm a tax resident of that country. I pay a little bit of tax to that country. Um, I've invested in that country and um, I don't even spend that much time there. So they get some money from me and I've invested and um, certainly, you know, taken some of our clients there. Um, so I'm paying a little bit of tax, more so than probably 90 eight percent of people 99 percent of people who live there i don't really get the full fleet of services i never ask for anything in return uh, i don't use you know the free health care anything like that and so that's where i am a, a tax resident um and so that allows me to make kind of you know certain investments around the world that um, i think get to use that status but i am uh, living in different places so um the other issue is as a former U.S. citizen, uh, I was taxed on the basis. For me, people think that people give up U.S. citizenship to avoid taxation, and that's certainly true for some people. Uh, for me, I had a pretty good tax situation, um, but it was becoming increasingly difficult, and I kind of sensed that it was going to become more difficult just with the whole kind of America first, and there was kind of things that would be targeting expats. I just said, why do I want more difficulty in my life for a country I just don't want to be in? It's, it's one thing to say, keep the citizenship because you want to go back in the future. I didn't. And so I gave it up. Um, and so now I hold no citizenship that either does tax me or would they impose lots of restrictions on me. Uh, it's never been a risk and I don't, I'm not concerned as I would be, if, for example, if I were Canadian, that Canada is gonna impose more and more strict regulations on me or Canada might in the future start taxing me based on my citizenship. And so uh, if you choose to renounce your US citizenship, that's kind of the next step for an American who just doesn't wanna be part of the every year documenting where they were and what they did. Um, and what their income was overseas. And, and so in that case, you basically just file an exit return called Form 8854. Again, I'm not giving you tax advice, but you basically list out what you have. There may be an exit tax required based on your uh, net worth or other conditions at time of departure. Uh, and then you know, from there, uh, you are done. So uh, that's how you get out of the system. Uh, I did not move my retirement accounts as I didn't have any. Uh, there really wouldn't have been a net change in a situation like mine, but I always believe just, hey, why am I putting money in a system that the government set up to basically for the next 40 to 45 years can change the rules anytime they want, so I didn't do that. But we do work with folks uh, and we have people who do IRA stuff or, uh, and, and you can either move it offshore, like it's not really a big change. I'm speaking more to the US perspective, but certainly uh, lots of people have retirement accounts and they just kind of sit there is what generally happens. Um, there's not really a big change there. So the issue in languages, when you're living in all these different countries, especially when I was much more focused on living in different places, um, I didn't learn all the different languages. Um, I certainly now, when I, when I spend time in places where there's not as much English spoken, have a team that helps me uh, when I'm there basically working with the team, I'm, I'm there in certain places just on business. Um, other places I live in kind of English speaking enclaves or I learn enough of the language or if it's Spanish, you know, maybe I, I learn, you know, it, it's, it's hard because there's obviously different, different um, versions of Spanish spoken in different countries. And so what gets me, you know, pretty far in Mexico or Spain, I go to Colombia where I do have a property and I'm, I find myself constantly repeating myself. So um, language skills aren't something that you necessarily have to have. I do think if you're gonna spend time in one part of the world, like if you're gonna spend time in Latin America, learn Spanish and focus on, which I didn't do, the part where you actually want to be. Uh, I at one point thought Mexico would be my place more than Colombia, but eventually um, decided that Colombia offered a, uh, a better deal. And so where am I at now? Um, we have companies that do, as I said, pay uh, some money for you know, part of the value, value chain um, worldwide. We have main headquarters, what I call the infrastructure, the corporate infrastructure that are generally in tax-free places. Uh, we do pay payroll taxes and, and actually quite a lot. Um, I live in places where I'm not either I'm either not triggering tax residents um, to therefore, you know, potentially cause an issue with the tax residents that I have, or where I simply don't own anything. So uh, I'm a resident of the UAE. I maintain it as a physical immigration residence. I don't maintain a tax residence there. If I wanted to live there, I could, and obviously that's pretty clean cut. Um, and other countries, it's like, listen, if you spend 183 days here, you pay, and if you don't, then you don't. And the fact that I'm not a citizen of some of those countries helps. The fact that they're also more flexible than many Western countries, I don't think that would apply to Germany, right? People think if they don't spend 183 days in Germany, they're fine. No, it's generally countries that don't have as clear and flexible tax rules. And so the way that I look at it, and I think the way that some of these countries' tax codes are put together, when I've talked to various politicians, for example, is a country that is more of an emerging country would rather have more flexibility on the tax side for a foreigner and have them bring in money. Because when I did the calculations a couple years ago on like, let's say I, I spend four months a year in Malaysia, 
uh, even if I don't have any locally sourced income to be taxed, uh, in that four months, contributing more in sales taxes and all kinds of other kind of taxes. I mean, just uh, during the pandemic, uh, our, our wine budget, I think we probably contributed more money just in the heavy taxes there, on heavy duties on alcohol, than like, you know, 20 average families. And so countries that want to be competitive say, okay, listen, you weren't, gonna, you weren't making any money from our system anyway. Your money's all overseas. You're not gonna come here if we're gonna tax you at the same 43% rate you were paying in the US. But we know if you come here, you're gonna spend a boatload of money and we'll make it all back in other kinds of taxes. You're contributing to the economy. And by the way, you're here for four months a year and you don't take anything. You're not coming to the hospitals. When you go to the hospital, you go to the Prince Court Hospital and you pay a fortune and <laughs> for them at least and, and, and it works well. So the rate probably is somewhere, you know, one point something right now. And obviously the, 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 the share of which that 1.5, let's say, is taxed on is still substantially more, I mean, than almost anybody would pay in the U.S. and certainly that anybody in Malaysia or Colombia or Georgia would pay. And so overall, I think that, you know, my message is uh, I defend it because you can contribute a lot more to a country. And if you're moving to a place where you like the lifestyle, you like the people, I feel in many ways, um, you know, especially in like a Georgia, for example, I really get along with people now and I see more of their cultural perspective on some things than I would perhaps um, even where I come from anymore. Um, not on everything, but on some things. And so I like contributing to the country. We follow the laws. And uh, I think that a lot of a country like that is better off having money coming in, um, having people who are contributing to the economy. And uh, I think that you can go where you're treated best and you can contribute in the same way. The fact that you're not paying 43% to be treated badly, to be told it's expected of you, isn't really a standard that works in a place when we have 255 countries and territories that are now competing for your wealth.